This video, which does contain my new kitchen reveal, is sponsored by Audible. Start listening with a 30-day free trial by using my link in the description. All over the world, but especially here in the southern United States, cooking occupies a very different place in society now than it did a century ago. And that is a change that we can see manifest in the physical design of kitchens. This is the story that my 100-year-old kitchen told as we stripped it down and built it back up again. And here are the first characters in that story. They're called the Blooms. They lived in my house from the time it was built through the majority of the 20th century. They owned a laundry business here on Cotton Avenue in downtown Macon, Georgia. And I know a lot about them because for people of a certain status, the newspaper was Facebook before Facebook destroyed the newspaper. These are notes I found in what they used to call the society pages. Miss Carolina Hess of Atlanta was the charming honor guest of Mr. and Mrs. Bloom at a Christmas dance party here in 1923. Quote, the attractive home was artistically decorated with holly, smilax, and quantities of lovely flowers. At a late hour, refreshments were served. Oh, I just bet they were. So this is the Bloom's house, but if you look closely in the dining room and in the kitchen, there are clues, clues of someone else being in this house, someone not mentioned in the newspapers. But first, let me show you the kitchen as we found it when we bought this house eight years ago. Definitely not the original kitchen. I always liked this kitchen just fine, except for the floor. I don't know who thought outdoor slate tile would be good for a kitchen floor, but it was not. It was simply impossible to clean. We always knew that we wanted to tear this out, and when I started making cooking videos in this kitchen for a living, we realized that we could do a lot to make it better for shooting. So we called up our friend Brant Freeman, a very talented cabinet maker and kitchen designer here in Maine. He told us right away that he could maximize our use of space through smarter design and better materials, namely maple wood. A lot of the older kitchens um, would have been using pine face frames, and they didn't have the strength to get away with things like dividers in between doors, or they always had to use two or three inch face frame pieces, which minimize the size that a drawer can be. Um, so the room in general is pretty big for a kitchen, um, but it's got some pretty obscure angles to it um, and some different ceiling heights. Indeed, we always assumed this short little nook over here was an addition someone built onto the house. It even looks like that on the outside. That nook is right above this. Buildings that have been added onto often lack design logic, and counter to conventional logic, Brant told us that we could give ourselves more space by walling off our little pantry closet. He said preserving access to it was costing us more space than it gave us. He wanted to put the fridge in front of it. By putting the refrigerator here instead of where you had it here, it fits into this corner very nicely so that it's not jutting out super far. Made sense to us, so Brant and his guys came over and painstakingly disassembled the whole kitchen. We were able to donate the old cabinets and granite countertops to Habitat for Humanity. It's a global charity based here in Georgia that builds and refurbishes homes with people who need them and who can't afford to do it themselves. When the flooring guys got in and finally chiseled out that god-awful slate, we realized that nook was not an addition at all. It was a balcony. Note how there's no subfloor under the original floor, that there is the ground underneath, and note how the floor is slanted to one corner like that. That's for drainage to let the rainwater fall away from the house. The fact that an outdoor porch or balcony originally adjoined what would have been a very small kitchen was not a surprise at all to my former colleague, Dr. David Davis, Associate Director of the Center for Southern Studies at Mercer University. Back porches were, were pretty normal um, as part of the climate control of the house as a way to create ventilation from one end to the other. It's also part of the place where the African-American domestic worker would have performed part of her chores. She may have hung wet laundry here to dry, especially on rainy days, such as we're having right now. So back up, right? How does Dr. Davis know that an African-American, probably a woman, worked in this house for the white family that lived here? Well, the house tells us. As is common for bungalows of this era, the dining room is the center. All the other rooms radiate out from it, and on the floor, under where we normally have our big table, there's this brass fixture for a foot pedal. Would have uh, been perfectly placed for the lady of the house to gently, quietly, and surreptitiously ring a bell that would have buzzed in the kitchen just behind us here sending a message to a domestic servant that it was time to take away dirty dishes or change a course or otherwise summon labor. 
This buzzer tells us a lot about the relationship because it hides the labor from the guest. Now, there's an interesting part of the process going on in your house right this minute. You're renovating the home and you are fundamentally changing the relationship between the kitchen, the service space, and the public part of the house. You're bringing people into your kitchen because you feel that it is a key part of your home structure. Well, as the architecture of this house demonstrates, that has not always been the case. Let's go into the kitchen. Note how the entrance is shunted off to the side and check out this funny hook in the door frame. Well, that's not a hook, that's a door stopper. So this, see here there's a pivot point. This would have been a swinging door. And this would be a stopper so the door didn't swing in. How many houses these days have any kind of door separating the kitchen from the rest of the house? So separating the dining room and the kitchen itself is this space. This is a butler's pantry. Their china, crystal, silver would have been stored here. And this would also have been a staging area where if the family's having a dinner with guests over, uh, different courses would be rested here before going into the dining room table. There's a buffer between the public space of the house and the service space in the kitchen. And this is, of course, the polar opposite from the way that homes are designed nowadays. Today, any house under construction is likely to have an open kitchen where the labor of the household is performed usually by the wife, the mother, the, the parents, the family, and that becomes the heart of the home. Notice how substantially different the architecture is here because it literally, physically, architecturally segregates labor away from the family space. And to an extent, this sea change in home design was unique to the Southern United States, where domestic servitude was functionally an extension of slavery. The Northern US may have ended slavery by force, but post-Civil War, Southern whites took great pains to perpetuate what they euphemistically called the Southern way of life. Domestic work and farm work were simply among the few occupations allowed to African Americans. Here's my neighborhood. It's called Vineville. Here's Pleasant Hill, the black neighborhood where most of Vineville's domestic workers went home at night. The past is not even past. Well, I suppose at least one aspect of the past is past, we don't have a domestic servant. I do most of the cooking. What happened? Well, Dr. Davis says at least this one aspect of the Southern way of life was ended by the post-World War II industrial boom. As you can imagine, an African-American woman working within a segregated white space in the white household would feel restrained. This would have been a complicated, fraught environment for a person to work in. So the opportunity to work elsewhere even in factory work and any other occupation would have been very attractive. So there is a pressure of pushing African-American women out of the white, the white household. It is, of course, not an accident that these events coincided with the civil rights movement, which fought against the Jim Crow laws that effectively kept so many African-Americans in a state of domestic servitude. At the same time, there is a capitalist market opportunity here. In the middle of the 20th century, there's an entire new industry in creating domestic labor-saving products. Things like washing machines and dryers and microwaves and dishwashers and frozen foods. All of a sudden, cooking wasn't such hard and dirty work anymore. Higher status people didn't feel as much of a desire to pay somebody else to do it. And as this process goes on, it merges into the women's movement of more and more women who had before lived primarily in the home working outside of the home, thus changing even more significantly the relationship between the family and the domestic space. Indeed, convenience foods have since become a marker of low status. Cooking from scratch is a luxury for those who have the time. That's how a poor man's pasta became posh. Which brings us back to my new kitchen, and here it is. Instead of hiding cooking away in a closet, we have put cooking at the core. Literally, Brant moved the oven from the wall over there to an island right here. Sure, this is to accommodate the making of recipe videos. I've got 360 degrees of shooting angles and check out the new oven with the downdraft fan. It pulls steam right away from the lens and down here under that porch where the laundry used to hang on rainy days. But beyond the practical, I think there's something metaphorical here too, right? Why are you watching cooking videos on YouTube? Why am I making them? 
I think part of it is that the social status of cooking has gone up a lot since this house was built. And why? I don't think that's entirely because the food changed. I think it's because the people doing the cooking changed. I'm doing the cooking, which is why the oven moved from backstage to center stage. Should I feel guilty about that? Should that stop me from enjoying my new kitchen? I don't know, I'm not sure I really wanna tell you how I feel about such things, and I'm pretty sure you don't wanna hear about it. But I do think that learning history is an intrinsic good. It's good to understand how things got to be the way they are. What you do with that information is up to you. And I look forward to making a lot more informational content for you in here. Lots of things here are going to make that job easier. The walls are all white. This will reflect light and make for smooth ambient glow in the room. It makes my artificial lighting look less extreme. These beautiful countertops that Brandt chose, black granite, honed rather than polished. That gives them a matte finish that'll minimize reflections, and the food will really pop off the black color like it did my old black table. My family is going to have a lot of fun in here, and it'll be made better with Audible, the sponsor of this video and the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. Whether you're cooking, washing dishes, or doing anything else that requires half your brain at most, Audible can help you make your time more fun and productive. If you want some more thoughts on the rapidly evolving social status of cooking, let me recommend listening to Anthony Bourdain's second book, Medium Raw. Kitchen Confidential he wrote when he was an angry nobody behind a stove. Medium Raw he wrote after he'd suddenly become a celebrity chef and it's filled with musings about what a weird journey that was. Roasted bird. Head, beak, and feet still attached, guts intact inside its plump little belly. All of us lean forward, heads turned in the same direction as our host high pours from a bottle of Armagnac, dousing the birds, then ignites them. Lordy, I miss that guy. You should listen to his books. Each month, Audible members get a credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests and other great stuff. Do us both a favor and get a free 30-day trial. Visit audible.com slash Adam That's audible.com slash Adam Or text Adam Ragusea to 500-500. That's all down in the description. Thank you, Audible. And hey, thank you for watching my videos. Your clicks paid for this kitchen. Now let me get to work. Work in here and make some more things for you to click on.